Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the new screensavers is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of the new Screensavers is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life, and that's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. Add touch to your MacBook for a dollar. Learn to play guitar with LEDs and Nanoleaf's color-changing light panel. Live from Tweet, it's the new screensaver. Thank you to Adi for doing the open. Uh, welcome to the new Screensavers. This is episode 154, recorded Saturday, April 28, 2018. I'm Jason Howell. I'm Rich Tamiro. Thanks uh, for having me back, by the way. Absolutely. It's good to good to have you back, man. It's, it's good to be back. This, this is a great place, by the way. <laughs> you guys have like a dream job here. It's fun. Well, and prior to this, you did what you did last time. You, you were the tech guy no pressure no anything. pressure to sit in leo's chair i mean come <laughs> on oh my gosh what a cool studio he has um but yeah we did the, the radio show now yeah. i'm doing this uh so i come up for two days and just kind of get the most out of it uh, so i have to ask because i've never well obviously i've never been the tech guy or even the replacement tech guy and, <laughs> and that's okay only from, from from the perspective of like sitting in that chair for three hours and getting questions yeah. Like that, you you have no idea what you're going to get asked, right? Well, like, what's that pressure? Like? Um, or is there any pressure associated with it? No, there's. I mean, there's two things. First off, you know, you got a call screener. So yeah. Kim, I mean, that she helps. looks. So yeah. you see, kind Absolutely. of, you have an idea of some of the calls. And believe me, Leo, he is willing to tackle even the most, you know, tiny you know, detail questions kind yeah. of things. Me, I'm much more looking at them. I'm like, I think I understand this one. So <laughs> um, I definitely choose questions I think I know the answers to. Yeah, yeah. But it's also fun because you kind of, you know, with the internet and all this stuff you can research. I mean, I don't know. It, That's cool. There is no answer, really. You just kind of have to wing it. Yeah, basically. you kind of go along. And, um, yeah. and if you don't know, you're like, good question. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know what you come up with and then give us a call back next week. Yeah. Uh, well, cool. Well, you're doing an awesome job, obviously. Uh, with the tech guy, and it's it's great to have you back here, man. Keeps you on your toes, that's for sure. You don't, yeah. But you also one thing, uh, you don't realize how much you know about tech until you do something like that. Oh, I'm sure. Because you 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 know you know you're doing this stuff every day. Yeah. You don't talk about every single little nuance of using these devices and stuff in right. a detailed manner. So. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. Well, we've got a lot of uh, really cool stuff to show off. I don't know, you know, maybe you see some in the background. We'll talk about that in a second. But first, everyone is doing it except. For Apple, we're going to uh, touch base with an MIT student who has figured out how to turn a MacBook Pro into a touchscreen Mac with a little device that costs a dollar. How cool is that? Yeah. And uh, Megan Maroney is going to show us the modular smart light system from Nanoleaf. Excellent. I saw those actually in the office, and every time that they're on, like I want them on my wall. I don't know if that's where they're supposed to go, but they look really cool. Okay. This is like the light show because I'm also going to show off something you can see in the background. That's my guitar, but it's blinking at you. And that's because it has something called Fret Zealot installed on it, and it's really cool. It's kind of like a you know a, a flashy uh, LED strip for a guitar that also will teach you how to play guitar. And I'm going to see if I can teach you how to play guitar, Rich. We will see. I have not played. <laughs> guitar before. Okay? Perfect. So if this works, I will buy it. Yeah, that, that's what makes for good TV, is if you've never played before. Oh, yeah. The best <laughs> the best TV is just watching a moron try to play guitar. Yeah. Uh, we're going to answer a call for help about choosing the right Android phone. That's going to be a great question. Plus, we're going to answer more of your questions in the mailbag. But before we do that, it's time for Hot Topics. A couple of news stories that we've been following throughout the week. And I uh, thought we'd kind of start off with Amazon because I feel like 
Well, I mean, of all the really big technology companies, Facebook, Google, Amazon, they almost always have like this, this steady stream of news yes. in a single week. Always. And so, so I mean, any of them probably could have fit into this category, but Amazon did something that really moved it up to the top. It changed the pricing structure of Amazon Prime. It didn't and we, do it very often, no. but it did. No, the last time they changed it was four years ago. It used to be 99 bucks. Now it's up to 119 yep. starting on, uh, what is it? It's May 16th for the new customer, May 11th May for the 11th, new customers, right. June 16th for existing customers. My renewal date is the 26th of December, by the way. Oh, so you've got the, some time. Well, but it's the worst possible time. It's after I'm literally spent from all my Christmas shopping, <laughs> and then Amazon's like, by the way, can I get an extra hundred and now $20 <laughs> from you? I'm like, okay, fine. Well, you know about it in advance, I suppose, so that gives I you know, some time. No, it always surprises me. Every <laughs> single year, I'm just like, oh, what's this 120 bucks? Well, 100 bucks from Amazon. So that means when you first signed up for Prime, you were like a late latecomer. You, you were looking in retrospect and going, wow, I spent a lot of money on Amazon on Christmas this year. I should really do this right now, but... You, the you way I remember it process. is that I, I literally signed up the first day Prime was available. Can we figure out when Amazon Prime launched? Because I was like... I, I was paying, I think it was $59 a year or okay. 79 I don't know what. Yeah. It was really cheap. I mean, it's, it's come it up just from keeps, me. it's like cable TV. Right. It just keeps creeping 2005. up. 2005. 2005. I was in Shreveport, Louisiana. Okay. And uh, I was a reporter down there, and I was like, I can't believe this company is going to ship us stuff second day. Because yeah. back then, remember when shipping, it was like, you know, to get the second day shipping, it was like 40, 50 bucks for I mean, something. Yeah, and I mean, ordering anything online, you were just assuming that you were going to pay a hefty, you know, extra fee for shipping. I mean, attack on, you know, five, eight, depending on where you're, where you're talking about, dollars. And then to think that Amazon was just going to let you get second day all the time. And now we've gotten so used to it, right? Like, we're so accustomed to this idea that right. we're going to get things a couple of days later. That's why Amazon is the behemoth that it is. So do you think that with this $119, people, I feel like it's the first time people are going to think about that fee. Even though when you do the math, for yeah. me last year, it was a dollar per shipment. Yeah. So, and this year it would be like a dollar fifteen. You know, based on how many orders I place. Yeah. Do you think people are going to think about what they're spending and say maybe I'll not renew? I'm sure there's a there's a percentage of people that will, but ultimately, like I think everybody that is a Prime user, like one of the the magical things about what Amazon has is that Prime users love being a Prime user. Yes. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of uh, pride's probably not the right word, but of all the things that you spend a lot of money on online, I don't know if I've met many people that have been like, I don't know why I pay for Prime. Like, everybody loves the <laughs> this fact year that you will meet those people. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, but it's 20 extra bucks, which I guess, you know, anytime fees go up, you question it. Netflix does this, and you're like, well, I don't know. Is an extra dollar, you know, a month worth it for the streaming video? But for the most part, people stick around because they like it for a reason. Here's where I think all these new companies have an advantage over the old companies. So when they used to raise your price for something, it would be like a bill you got and you saw it and you're like, oh, this is now this yeah. much. Nowadays, it's all on your credit card and mm -hmm. it's all automatic. These uh, automatic. So, you so Netflix. You're staring at it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So you, it may take you three months to realize that your your costs went up. In my case with Amazon, like I see the bill like, you know, 30 days after it gets charged. By that time, what are you going to do? Call them up and be like, uh, I don't want to pay the $119 <laughs> for all this stuff you shipped me over the, the holiday season. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you've got options too. There, there are other ways to kind of get around this if you like. Uh, there's a household feature where you can add people to your household and kind of share the cost that way. Uh, $59 a month if you're a .edu student, if you're a student with a .edu uh, email address, so you can shave off some money that way. Um, also, they, they have options for you know lower cost households, five ninety nine a month for qualified EBT and Medicaid customers. So they have other ways that you can kind of you know get in there if you want to just pay monthly for only the yeah, month that you need it. Yeah. You can drop in there for like twelve ninety nine, which there is kind of funny. So you pay twelve ninety nine a month, which times twelve months is more. Right. But people like that monthly cost. Yeah, you know, drop in when yearly. you need it, drop yeah. out when you don't. That's kind of how I treat my uh, my over the or my uh, TV is I use these, yeah. YouTube YouTube TV or, or uh, w you know one of those services. Drop in when the Olympics are starting. Pay for that single month, and then I never watch TV anywhere anytime else. So I drop out of it. So <laughs> same kind of idea. So um, other things that Amazon is up to before we kind of move along. Amazon Echo Dot Kids. Apparently, there's a kids edition now. So if you, like I, in, in our household, we're Google Home, and we have uh, the Google Home minis in our kids' room, and they love it, you know, they play music on it and everything. But I do wish that it had some of these features. You yes. Get, you know, things like uh, explicit song filtering, which you can do on Google Home, uh, bedtime limits, uh, it's disabled the voice purchase 
option, which is probably <laughs> a good thing. It's a smart thing to have disabled <laughs> on your kids. Uh, my thing is, um, you know, for the kids thing, I love that they do the please. If your kids say please to Alexa, it'll like it'll reward them for that. Oh, really? Like it I actually didn't know likes, that. yeah. So it likes when they use like please and thank you. And I've noticed when my kids talk to, by the way, in my house were Siri, Alexa, and Google because I Dang. can't decide. Um, so my kids like in my car, they'll be like, "Are you using Alexa today?" Or well, Siri or Google. Right. And so they have different ways of talking to them. And then my kids will actually wonder. They'll be like, "What if like Siri was Google's grandma?" Like they have, like they literally have these like scenarios that are going through the you know my six year old's mind, and I'm just like, it's a weird. I can one. see them instead of playing with action figures or dolls, right. they've got like a Google Home Mini in one hand and an Echo Dot in the other, and then yeah. Siri doesn't know uh, the answer to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Siri wins. Uh, and then finally, uh, apparently, and and we we kind of experienced this already, went through these growing pains with Google Home, uh, always listening, but security researchers discovered that they could create a, uh, well, it was seemingly harmless, a skill that would ultimately stay recording audio long after the skill had been uh, deactivated or turned off. Ooh, uh, that's not nice. They notified Amazon, Amazon, you know, did, uh, they fixed the issue, but it was possible, uh, so. I don't know if that changes anybody's feelings on, on their home assistants or not. I don't think so. I think the idea that we're inviting a microphone into our houses, yeah. you know, it's pretty amazing that people are accepting that in a mass way. Yeah, that's because they do some really cool things. They do. I don't, I don't know if it's, if, if it's a worthy trade-off, but apparently, I mean, myself included, apparently we're okay with that. I think so. Yeah. Uh, other news, Snapchat. Did you ever get this for the first spectacles? I did. You know, I'm kind of not... I'm, what's the word? It's like bullish or bearish. Whatever the, the negative one is. That's me on Snapchat with these spectacles. You're bearish, yeah. But I will say with the new version, which are now water resistant, yeah. they're kind of thinner, uh, better profile, better quality, faster transfers, higher price tag. Yep, couple, uh, $20 more. Yeah, so 150 versus yep. 130 um, I don't know. I'm actually quite tempted to purchase these. Are you a regular Snapchat No, not user? at all. I don't oh. even have it on my phone. And I tried it for a week after reading uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's book about, you know, just being everywhere all the time. And yeah. I'm like, all right, I'm all in. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, nobody cares about what I'm doing 24-7, right? <laughs> um, but I do, I do think it's really interesting on all the promo videos for this. If you watch their little YouTube video, they show a lot of parents with kids. And mm. so I can definitely see now they're oh. kind of trying to reach that new market of, hey, your kid is always doing cool, interesting, weird things. Why don't you capture it with these glasses? And now they look better than before. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I might be sold on them. I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to purchase them. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely identify with that. And usually when Spectacles comes up, this, this you know, I reference this, but way back when Google Glass was a thing, oh, yeah. uh, I Thankfully stayed home I with my that. then, well, she was one year old, my one year old daughter at the time. She's now five. Uh, and I put on Google Glass. I was staying home with, with her because she was sick, and I just had this feeling that she was going to take her first steps. And sure enough, I was able to put on my Google Glass and record from my perspective, her Amazing. taking her first steps walking towards me. So I get it. If they're, if they're like doubling down on that as the message, as, as one of the ways to sell spectacles, that's a really great way to do it because parents immediately identify with just what a great time capsule reward that is to be able to re-experience these magical moments that your kids are, are, are going through in a way that reminds you of the, not just the fact that it happened, but seeing it through your eyes once yeah. again, which is what I get when I go back to that video. I'm like, I remember being there and I see, it's almost like a straight feed for my eyes watching her walk towards me. So it's a great, it's a great reason for these to exist. Do you think they're gonna be more uh, successful because they had a lot of unsold stock on Spectrum? Yeah, which is kind of interesting because the last one, uh, all the stories said they had to dump all this old stock that yeah. sat in a warehouse. Apparently they reused some of the parts for the new ones. Okay. I heard that. Um, I don't know. I think that there, the interest is there. If the technology is better and it transfers better and all this stuff, right. I don't know. If I go to a birthday party and I start seeing parents wearing these things, I'm just going to be like, all right, I don't know. I don't know <laughs> what to think about that. Yeah, I hear you. Although I have to, like, yet again, remember to my Google Glass days, and there was a time where I went to my daughter's preschool for a, a gymnastics Pre uh, performance. Sure, and you got kicked out because they're like, you look way too weird. Th this was before the back. It was before the backlash, you know, because right. there was a, suddenly there was that big glass backlash, 
and uh, it Last was before flash, that. Yeah, when, yes, they probably called it that. Uh, and I did feel weird, but I got the whole thing, you know, with Google Glass wearing it. So I was that guy. So you have from among when your parents kids, wearing them. When your kids were like zero to three, you have the grainiest VGA <laughs> videos of your kids doing all kinds of amazing things. Yes. That when they're like 27, they're going to watch it on these like 16K TVs, yes. and it's going to take up like one yeah, corner. Yeah, it's the size of a stamp. Perfect. Basically. So you did yeah, well. See? I was I was I was a forward thinker. Good parenting back in there. my day. <laughs> uh, and finally, so this is a weird story. Okay, um, a decades-old cold case uh, is apparently solved, and it's all thanks to an online genealogy site called GED Match, which I had never heard of the of the site GED Match. But basically, the Golden State Killer. You've probably already heard about this because it's made a lot of news. Also known as the original Night Stalker, East Bay Rapist, whole lot of horrible, te you know, terrible things terrorized California between 1974 to 1986. Well, apparently, investigators were able to pull. You know, they had the DNA from one of the murders uh, like 40 years ago, mm -hmm. and they decided to run that through GED Matches. Uh, online analysis tool. It's a free service. Anyone can go in there and from what I understand, the idea is that if you use any of these other genealogy sites, you can actually export the raw data from that and upload it here and you know, be, because it's free, the idea is that everybody takes the you know their their results, uploads them up, and you might find more matches that way. Right. It's kind of like an open source yeah. DNA match site. Right. Um, I did mine on uh, what's the one uh, DNA Ancestry DNA. Okay. Um, and and I heard what I was reading from Ancestry and the other one, Twenty Three and Me. Sure. They don't really share the data with people, especially law enforcement, unless it's like super you know important, like they get like a, a warrant for it. Right. But this is kind of like every. Everyone uploads. And right. so anyone, and not only that, anyone is free to kind of slice and dice this information for research or just yep. personal. Um, so this is really crazy because if you think from this guy's standpoint, the, the, the serial killer that they found, did he ever think that whatever he, I guess he discarded something, okay. like a, something in a trash, like they tracked him for a while because yeah. they had an idea that it was him and were able to match it up with this stuff that they found here. Yeah. I mean, that is just wild. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. And it wasn't a direct match to him. It was a direct match to some of his, like uh, a, some, one of his relatives. Right. And that then kind of goes back to this idea of, you know, it's kind of like Cambridge Analytica in a, in a sense. It's this idea that even we might not be sharing something online. You know, right. someone in his family went onto this site and, and shared their DNA, and that was enough of a, enough of a link right. to pull the investigators in that direction. There's so many ways that, that our information, whether we're sharing it or whether someone else is sharing their information and how that crosses with our information, right. so many ways that this stuff can be uh, cross-matched and, and you know, obviously you can catch a, you know, a cold case killer. You gotta understand from his standpoint, it probably would have been pretty awkward if he was like, look, friends and family, don't, our family, please don't share your you DNA. Could you not do that? Yeah, because, totally. Because yeah, I just don't, yeah, there might be some uh, sketchy past in my my history, uh, I just don't want that out there. So just, <laughs> I'm just saying, if you just, just hypothetically speaking, burn all your yeah. straws, uh, you know, whatever you touch with your mouth, you know, just oh. make sure it's incinerated because I don't want my DNA anywhere. Uh, no, I mean, I, this is just the probably one of the most unique uses of kind of an online website DNA. Yeah storage that I've ever heard of in my a life. Absolutely, and just crazy that it that it was the solution for a 40-year case, and such a big one at that. I mean, this really had them stumped uh, mm -hmm. for a very long time. Uh, so that's a few things that we've been uh, kind of tracking before we kind of dive into the rest of the really cool stuff. It all has kind of strange, like strangely, this show is very light focused, so you'll see as we go along. Before we get into that, we're going to thank the sponsor of today's episode of the new Screensavers, and that's Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. If you've gotten a mortgage yourself or you're thinking about getting one or you know someone that has, you might already know that the mortgage experience is not the easiest thing in the world. It's been dated. It needed a client-focused technological revolution. And that's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage by uh, Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence that you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple. It allows you to fully understand all the details and be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. It's also powerful. Whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds. It's all based on your income, your assets, your credit, and Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of the home loan options for which you qualify 
and then find the one that's just right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, all you have to do is go to rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. That's rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states. NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. And now, uh, we're going to head over and take a look at a MacBook with a touch screen. What? Yeah, it, it exists, and it's right over here. Let's head on over and take a look. We're going to talk with Kevin Quok. Uh, What's up? Yeah. We're going to take a look at this. How do you, what is, how do you have a MacBook <laughs> with a touch screen? Because I think my kids think my MacBook has a touch screen, <laughs> and they're just hitting it. And that's why all the fingerprints on your display. Oh. I didn't want to say anything, but you brought it up, so. You know, actually, I... Look, I try to uh, <laughs> clean it every once in a while. I did clean it the other day, actually, and I couldn't believe how. I was like, this looks like a new computer. Wow, <laughs> I need to do this more yeah. often. Um, so, so the most important question is, how dirty does your display get now that you're touching it all the time? The, so there's a like certain <laughs> field of view where uh, you, it, the touchable region is like this. So if uh, I turn down the brightness, you could see there's just a triangle. Of smudges. <laughs> so it's like those when people put in their passcodes, you know, and you can yes. like read it. It's like your computer. We know your passcode right now. <laughs> so this is really cool. All right. So let, let's uh, take a step back a little bit. First of all, Kevin Kwok, thank you uh, for for thank hopping for in me. with us today and uh, showing us kind of the technology and where you are right now with bringing touchscreen yeah. to a MacBook Pro. And, you know, we've shown it off a, a little bit on screen. Uh, it's a work in progress, I would say, at this point, yeah. right? Uh, tell us a little bit about, about the project, kind of where, yeah. where you got the idea for it and, and why. So uh, I had the idea uh, first when I was in middle school. Uh, this was like eight years ago. Um, and uh, I, I just saw these TED Talks where people were talking about multi-touch and this new thing called the iPhone. Uh, and I thought this was really cool and I wanted my own because obviously I couldn't afford an iPhone or like uh, Microsoft's uh, like Surface. Yep. Um, so I like nagged on my mom. I went to the arts and crafts store and like I, I got like pieces of plastic, little bits of mirror, uh, and it like I, I sort of tried putting them together and trying to figure out if there was a way to build a touchscreen. Like the normal ways for building it involved lasers and like complicated optics, uh, and I didn't have access to any of that and couldn't afford any of that. So uh, I had this idea of uh, sort of recognize that if you're putting your finger against a mirror, uh, you can tell that you're uh, touching the surface of the mirror if your finger looks like it's touching its own reflection. Wow. Um, uh, okay. And you so came up with that in eighth, or was this later? Yeah, this, this was like in eighth grade. Wow. I, uh, you know, I wasn't doing that kind of stuff <laughs> in eighth grade. Um, you guys playing video games. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so you, you, when did you get, you know, okay, so well, tell me what this, what it is now. So how did yeah. you go from there to actually building this little so, uh, device? I told uh, a couple of my friends uh, at college about this idea, and they were like, you know, um, Apple doesn't like uh, like for some reason uh, they like shepherded uh, they like spearheaded this whole touchscreen revolution, but they never added it to their Macs. So how about you just take uh, one of those tiny craft mirrors, uh, a paper clip or something, and then uh, attach it to your monitor? Uh, and they came up with this idea to like just bring it to laptops. Um, and so uh, we did this uh, about like a year ago. Uh, with my teammates, uh, Guillermo Webster, Anisha Athley, and Logan Engstrom. Uh, they couldn't make it today, but. And so it's a little, is that a mirror up there? Yep. That's, so that's a mirror connected mirror. with a, uh, what, uh, paper six, clip? Yeah, it, it's about six inches of like wire and some scotch tape. That you coiled, and what's the scotch tape do? Uh, it, it attaches the uh, wire to the mirror. Oh, that sounds like a good function for scotch tape. Uh, <laughs> Wait so, a minute, it tapes it? <laughs> Wait, it tapes this it to the... This is revolutionary. Hold on. Okay, so, um, and it's, what's it actually doing? So it's taking the reflection, or it's kind of, it's aiming the camera back into itself? Yeah, so uh, I can open up uh, Photo Booth and you can see what the computer sees. Oh, uh, you wow. can see, like, basically uh, the, um, turn on the... So that's on. a, that's a, uh, so you could see, it sees the screen, yeah. uh, and if I put my finger here, you could see both my finger and its reflection. Oh. Uh, and you can tell that, like, here, because it's sort of not uh, touching, uh, you know that I'm not touching the screen, but here you know that it is. Um, oh, okay. And with this concept, you can uh, extract, uh, with a little bit of math, 
uh, three coordinates, the X, Y, and Z axes, uh, out of a 2D image. Ah, uh, see, I knew there was something complicated about this. <laughs> okay, you gotta know, like, math axes. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, on one hand, it's, it's one thing to create the, uh, the, the piece of hardware, you yeah. know, which, I mean, we were showing the walkthrough on how to make it. Anyone could make this. Yeah. It's very easy. Are you encouraging people to kind of experiment yeah. and make it themselves? Yeah. Um, like, I, I think uh, because it's such a simple idea, um, and, and the real idea is just that you can use reflections to get additional bits of information from pictures. Right. Uh, and you could use this for art installations, for like smart boards, uh, like large touch screens. You, you could probably do it for like, there, there's a lot of things that you could probably use this idea for. Sure. So, so, so on one hand, you've got the hardware. The other side is the software yeah. aspect, and like, how was that? I mean, it almost makes makes it seem like the hardware is the easy part. Yeah, coming up with the software that actually does what you were talking yeah. about, Rich. You know, the complicated math that's involved in doing this that had to be a big challenge. Yeah. Um, and it's still a work in progress. Uh, like you'll probably see soon enough that the software doesn't work all that well. Um. Well, there's there's apps that have been around for years, like on the right. on the App Store, that still crash. So I mean, we understand with this. So show us. Can you show us a demo of sure. kind of what? Um, what this is good for? Okay, so this is, yeah. what are we seeing right here? So this is the software uh, that um, sort of gives you an internal look at how, like, what's what going it's seeing, on. What so it's you can reading. see those, these, like, weird lines uh, represent the calibration points. Oh, um, and you can okay. see uh, it highlights my finger. Um, and when it recognizes that there is a, uh, uh, in, uh, a point in between, uh, when it recognizes that there's a reflection and my finger, uh, it draws that tiny little purple dot, um, and it does all the like weird math and figures out where on the screen in the screen's coordinates uh, my finger is, and that's where it draws the big yellow dot. Um, and if I uh, enable enable the mouse mode, it starts acting as basically a mouse driver, uh, and so uh, it will, as you can see, move my cursor around and uh, simulate click events. Ah, neat. OK. So, okay. W so obviously, this is working off of reflection. That's, that's yep. the prime kind of uh, driver of this technology. How does it know the difference between you know, a, ref a reflection of a finger and a reflection of everything else? Well, so uh, fortunately, there aren't that many other things. Does it work so with faces? <laughs> Well, I mean, it, but, but you can see right there. Does it enough. work with the nose? Like, Let's see. Like, there, there aren't many other things that get that close yeah. unless you're rich and you put your nose on your screen all the time. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, there are things that are appearing there, like these little, yeah. like, random reflections. How does it know not to act on those? Um, basically, it has a couple of pretty silly heuristics. Um, they don't work super well, but, uh, uh, like, it works enough for rejecting most of the noise. So I can open up, uh, here's a little app. Uh, it's a like little online piano. I, I One of my favorites. On Google. <laughs> Rich is really good at playing the JavaScript piano. I have this bookmarked. <laughs> <laughs> so you can play the piano with your finger. Well, uh, as sort if of. It were. So I mean, I've I never, I, I do this at work all the time, my downtime. I'm like, how can I play this darn piano with my fingers? Because I'm always like using the keyboard on yeah, my, no you know. wants to do that. So now yeah. you have made it possible. Yeah, so uh, you can see like pressing little buttons, uh, it sort of, Kind of recognizes where it is and plays the notes. <laughs> That's doing pretty this good. This is amazing. That is so cool. An angle of of the finger, like do you have to be dead on? You don't uh, have to be totally dead on. To... And some fingers work better. Like I noticed, mine has a, a pretty good uh, <laughs> contact point. You said it. You I, said it. Now stop working. Yeah, that's, that's Murphy's, works, Murphy's right. law of uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> DIY um, demos on on TV yeah. is once you say it's it's working perfectly for me, it stops. What do you see as the future for this? Is this technology that can be? I mean, you said like the art installations, that kind of stuff. Is this something that can be monetized? Is it something that you see will be built into bigger ideas in the future? Uh, I'm not sure uh, it should be monetized. Uh, like, I, I think what makes it so special is that really anyone can make it, and I feel like uh, it'd be better if we could like see this kind of technology, this idea being used for a bunch of different things in the future. So it's like mm. almost like Google Cardboard, you know, like you buy yeah, that right. on Amazon or you know for like five bucks, and you see what you do with it. Yeah, mm, I like yeah, that. So it's like the paperclip instead of cardboard. So you would have a little kit with everything you need, a piece of tape, a paper clip, yeah. and a tiny mirror? Yep. 
and maybe a flash drive with the software on it. How, where can people kind of find the software if, if they're building uh, these on their it's own? On, uh, it's on GitHub. So you can go to github.com slash uh, bijection slash sistine. Uh, it's called Sistine because uh, one of our first demos was uh, this picture of uh, I can, yeah, it, it was this uh, picture of uh, uh, Michelangelo's, Michelangelo's uh, creation of Adam, uh, touching God and a touch screen. And you can you can be the, the third person <laughs> in, it. in that for the very first time. <laughs> um, so you're talking about how how easy and, and you know this is for anyone to use and how that's kind of the approach. Do you have any uh, any plans to take this and, and prototype it? Uh, I don't know to a, to more kind of complete. Level or is it is it always meant to kind of be in this um, well, DIY we, fashion? We've uh, we've looked into this um, like uh, for a while. Uh, so uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, there's the triangular smudge pattern. Right. So uh, I couldn't, for instance, uh, x out of an app by clicking on the top right corner. No spotlight uh, for you. Yeah. No spotlight for me. Yeah. Um, and uh, one way of getting around that would be to have some sort of curved mirror. Uh, so it could have a wider field of view. Sure. Um, and so we looked a little bit into what it would take to fabricate one of these. Um, seems like it's kind of expensive, uh, and we sort of gave up on that. But um, if there's enough interest, maybe uh, we might continue. Uh, okay. Certainly, if there's uh, someone who's interested in sort of taking up uh, this project mm -hmm. uh, and going that extra mile, then I, I would love to be able to help. Awesome. So Apple next MacBook comes out with a touchscreen. Is life over? What's what's the deal? Like, well, is I think I'm out of a dollar. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> How Not are too you much ever going to live? Uh, I love this. This is yeah. so. This is so great. This. I love that we have people like you that are doing stuff like this. Because me, I would be like, I don't. I, I don't even understand my webcam. So <laughs> I, I just love the idea that you're like, what can I do with this in eighth grade? And now you've, you know, made yeah. this. This is amazing. Turn it into something. And and uh, you know, it also has the added benefit of being a security cover for your webcam. Yeah. Uh, when you're using it, anyways. Um, now, I have to say that when, when we were kind of getting set up to start the show, I went to sit down on this chair, and I almost sat on a turtle. Yes. Uh, and normally that's not weird. Um, <laughs> but I was told to ask about the turtle. So I've asked you about the turtle. What's the turtle all about? So this is a turtle that if you ask uh, Google's Inception v3 network, uh, it will say with really high confidence that this is actually a rifle. Um, so. Uh, what we've done, uh, th this was made by uh, much of the same people as the touchscreen, Anish Athlay, uh, Logan Engstrom, uh, and uh, uh, Andrew Ilias. Um, and this is uh, a 3D, what's called an adversarial example. Uh, and an adversarial example is a object or an image such that uh, when you run it through a black box neural classifier, uh, it does not what you expect. So to any human being, this is pretty clearly a turtle. Yes. Uh, but uh, if you like pay close enough attention, there's uh, some subtle variation in color uh, and like uh, some subtle warping of these patterns. Okay. And this sort of constitutes an optical illusion for many of these uh, neural networks. Um, and so it, it loses the ability to understand what it's seeing. Um, and, and classifies so it then this just, as a title. Uh, so then is it just making rifle. a guess? Or? It, it, it's not, it, it's even worse than making a guess. It's, it's actively deceived. It's, uh, it's it, saying, it doesn't even think that yeah. it's a turtle. This has pretty big implications. If yeah, let's say does. I'm a security company and I have laser cameras that kind of scan the crowd for something, would this mean that someone in the future would have a gun that is an adversarial, whatever you called it? Yeah, so. Uh, and it's tricking it's, it's my. An, System? It's almost like it's its own type of camouflage, really. It, it's, an, it's an open problem in uh, AI research that uh, nobody knows how to get rid of uh, these, uh, to create networks that are robust against these uh, adversarial examples. And what, so what is it about this? Is it the coloring? Is it the shading? Like, why does it, why does it trick it? Um, it's, that's kind of an open research question. Uh, some people have some, like, Mathy guesses, uh, but it comes back to math again. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, See, I'm just like very <laughs> filled with math. We're all confused. No. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, that's strange. So, uh, but there is some sort of of knowledge of what's going on here because you're able to create an object yes. that actively does it. So, how how did you get there? Like uh, to know, well, we can create this, and it's going to trick it into you know seeing a, a rifle. So this is kind of the uh, the, the like double edged sword of deep learning, uh, which is uh, deep learning is built on these constructs uh, that are. Uh, differentiable, which means you can run them either forwards or backwards. And so you start with a network which is completely randomly initialized. Uh, and then you change this network, you tweak the weights until it starts classifying this as a turtle. Mm. Uh, like it starts ah. classifying things correctly. But the other thing you can do is rather than changing the weights, you can keep the weights fixed and instead tweak the image. Uh, and you can tweak the image uh, under the condition that you're uh, perturbations are very subtle, uh, which is what's happening here. So we try to minimize the difference between this and a reference turtle, but somehow maximally confuse the network. And because of the way neural networks are just structured, uh, you can do this. And you can like build these types of objects. Does no, it, you can do this. Does it have to be a turtle? No. Can you do this with, I mean, this is just kind of a proof of concept, but can you apply, and would it be a different gradation and shading and, and things if it was a different object? Yeah, so uh, this idea uh, affects all of deep learning. So you can create objects, but uh, more sinisterly, you can create uh, audio snippets that to you just sound like wind, but to Alexa sounds like uh, echo uh, buy a thousand dollars worth of sand. <laughs> <laughs> mm. If you're a parent, yeah. you've actually done that before, which is kind of <laughs> sad. I, I think I think what this does oh God, is it was makes useful. the case for ev not just kids, but everyone to get that kids edition Echo Dot and turn uh, off the... New kids edition Echo Dot with the sinister mode turned off. <laughs> yes. If, you're, if there's sinister you. audio in your house, we will reject it. Don't no worry. problem. <laughs> wow, that is nuts. Um, and I mean, obviously, this is a really big issue that needs to be figured out. Doesn't doesn't look like we're any like anywhere near a, a solution or, or really understanding, which is not a very comforting thought to yeah. be honest. Especially considering how much everything in technology seems to be doubling down on artificial intelligence and neural networks to do to solve the world's problems. In air quotes. Yeah. Wow. So would this be the same thing in like Google Photos of like how it categorizes things and it yeah. kind of gets tricked sometimes? Is that similar problem? Yeah. So uh, there is uh, 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 actually uh, there's a good chance that Google's using a very similar, if not the same, network. So if mm -hmm. you snapped a picture of this, there's a decent chance that it would show up in your rifle collection. Interesting. I'm going to wow. do that when I get my camera back. <laughs> uh, this is all fascinating stuff. Um, it, I mean, they're 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 entirely different. I'm sure you guys are, are working on other projects. Yeah. What what else you got going um, on, Cooper? Well. Uh, Lots of things, um, <laughs> but uh, in the with the light theme. Uh, now we're going. We're totally uh -oh. off plan. None of this was planned. Just so you all know. With the light theme. Brace yourselves. I have this little box called the Toglo. Um, this is actually other like recycled touchscreen technology. So uh, the uh, standard way for building a touchscreen, uh, or one of the ways uh, people did it, was with a laser and a line uh, line lens that split it off. Right. Um, and. Uh, they typically use infrared light, but I thought uh, it'd be kind of cooler if it were on the ground and shooting visible light. And so uh, over there, uh, you can see the video of just, this is actually at an AI conference where we were showing off the turtle. Uh, but um, Now wait a minute, are the, okay, is the light coming from their shoes or from the ground? No, it, it, there's this box that's just lying on the ground and it's causing everyone in the room's feet to light up. That is what? pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. Do you have to have special shoes for that to work? Nope, just white shoes. If, if you were to lay down on the ground, would you be surrounded by an outline? Yeah. Wow, that is and crazy. And so are the, this looks like off-the-shelf stuff as well? Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I That's 3D really printed cool. some casing, but uh, yeah, it's like mostly off-the-shelf And components. is this it right here? Yeah. I mean, so you've got, oh, yeah, a little laser in here. Okay, it's just 3D printed, and then this is kind of the to let it um, you level. level it. Yeah. And then is this a little computer fan? It's just a fan, yeah. Wow, look at that. And then the little micro USB. Yep. Right coming, coming to dance club near you. <laughs> Will you do I mean, a USB-C version in the future? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, standards and all that. Just curious. 
Uh, really cool stuff, Kevin. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming on and showing us all this stuff. Where do you want people to go if they want to hop online and maybe download the software, get the plans for it, for the camera or everything else you work yeah, on? Yeah, um, so uh, you can find the software from this uh, on github.com slash bijection slash Sistine. Uh, and if you want to like follow uh, the things that uh, me and my friends are up to, you could for sure you want at, to uh, <laughs> at Antimatter15. Um, yeah, and shoot me an email if you have any ideas, and it'd be great to collaborate. Um, is this open source as well, uh, or is that? I don't know. Uh, oh, <laughs> uh, if people are interested, then maybe. Yeah, that's toglo.com. G L O. Very uh, cool. If people want to check that out because that is some pretty that cool is very stuff. cool. You're doing some awesome stuff. It's got to be a lot of fun. Thanks Thank you, Kevin. Me. Really, I uh, really appreciate you hopping on here and showing us how you're staying busy. Yeah. Very busy. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> really nice talking yeah. with you. Uh, so we played a little, um, what was it? it? It was JavaScript piano. Do you want to play some guitar, like yeah. real guitar? Uh, sure. OK. I'm going to teach, <laughs> teach Rich how you're to play You're going to teach guitar. me. You have to teach me, because I've never played guitar. <laughs> All right, let's head over there, and I'll show you something cool that hopefully will make this whole process a little bit easier uh, if things go as planned, which I will say in my time with this product, uh, it was a little touch and go at times. The product is really cool. It's called Fret Zealot, uh, but it has, feels early, let's just say okay. that. Okay. Some, some of the software that's involved here. So I brought my, uh, my trusty Epiphone. My less so you are you are a uh, musician. I mean, you just had an album come out, didn't you? Yeah, actually, it, it started. So I, I did a Kickstarter with. Uh, it, so it was called Yellow Gold um, Fever Dreamer, and I uh, did a Kickstarter, and it was successful. And it actually all the CDs for anyone that was backing the Kickstarter shipped out a couple of weeks ago. So okay. now I'm getting all the tweets of like, "Hey, check it out!" You know, taking a picture of the CD. You know, CDs. Do you know what a CD is? Because uh, yeah. no one uses CDs anymore. We remember those. But it's it's a cool souvenir. So everybody's getting that now so it's really great I'm, I'm super stoked that it's finally getting in people's hands actually Alex who's holding the the guitar or sorry the camera got his today and he pointed it out to me so great stuff there but um fret zealot so you can see from this uh from facing here with on the neck of the guitar you can see that it has this whole row of LEDs and that's kind of, I mean, this is the basis of what Fret Zealot is all about. It's $199.99, so it's, it's a little pricey. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I feel like it's a missed opportunity. They could have called it uh, Led Zeppelin or LED Zeppelin, uh -huh. uh, but they did not, and I think I understand why. They probably would have been Probably didn't want to deal with the, uh, <laughs> the legal implications. No, they'd be taken, taken to the cleaners. Yeah. But So it's essentially a custom strip of LEDs that's meant to fit a standard neck on a regular six string guitar. It looks really cool, by the way. It even I don't even know what it does yet, but it looks really cool. Let's see if so I can. So just the, the look, and I imagine if I played guitar, oh. yeah, you can just do kind of fun little yeah. things like that. If, if you were like playing on stage somewhere, this would be a cool kind of right, bonus right. thing to do, uh, to install onto your guitar. It was really easy to install, actually. Anthony has a little video that I recorded. I just set up my Pixel to XL while I was, you know, getting it all set up and, you know, I had to de-string the guitar. You could probably slide it on if the strings stayed on, but I needed to replace my strings oh, anyway. Oh, wow, so. you just snip them like that? Yeah. Oh. You don't need them anymore. You're gonna put new, brand new ones on. You clean, you know, clean the neck, and then you eventually, you just kind of start peeling the tape off of the fret zealot, and you want to make sure that you, you that you place it appropriately. But you you get it into place, and you have to you know kind of push it down. And one of my worries was that when it's actually installed within the frets, that it might be tall enough Too that it high. would interfere yeah. with the strings. But it really doesn't. It actually sits super low. And in in my uh, testing and playing around with it. Uh, it didn't get in the way at all, which thankfully, you know, <laughs> thankfully they, they thought that one through and, and they got there. And LEDs are so slim and so, you know, small as it is, it's just amazing that you can kind of do this. And in my case, if it didn't work out with teaching me the guitar, I would just install it under my cabinets in my kitchen and just let it, you know, <laughs> right. add some this mood is, lighting be, there. Yeah, add some mood lighting to your coffee maker. Um, so you can see, so basically it's this, it's the strips of LED and then you can see uh, up at the top that, well, this is a little capo, so this is how you snap the uh, electronics 
to the headstock of your guitar. You can actually just you know screw it in, plug it into that little plug that you see there, and then in in that that you're looking at right and almost right now, that's the battery pack. You have okay. that charged up. It kind of mounts to the headstock of your guitar, and that's where the brains are. Bluetooth. Uh, it, essentially, this is how it connects to whatever phone you might be using. So there's an Android app. There's also an iOS app, and uh, it syncs via Bluetooth. I will say that the Bluetooth connectivity was a little spotty, okay. and I, I, on, to be completely honest, I will be very surprised if we get through this demo and it doesn't drop off at least once. So and what is that? That's do? a big what, issue. What happens if it drops off? You if it drops off everything? suddenly, yeah, the, the lights will disappear on the on the neck, or they might continue blinking. But uh. anytime you go into the app and try and pull up a different function, it, nothing changes. Nothing, okay. And then you have to kind of like go through the resyncing process. Not to mention, if you happen to show the app uh, that I have, I, I should have it casting, up at the top you can see the, the logo that says Fret Zealot and the little Bluetooth icon. It's like very tucked away and kind of hard to see up there. And so, and, and mind you, this is on an iPad. This may be more meant for an iPhone than an iPad, but it's really hard to know when your Bluetooth okay. disappears. You so know what I mean? So should make that indicator it's just, larger. It's just, well, it's just suddenly everything stops working, and if depending on what screen you're in, you don't have that readout, and you're like, wait a minute, what just happened? Oh, okay. And you kind of have to figure it out. So kind of walking through the app real quick, and then I promise we're going we're gonna to put okay. this guitar on you, and I'm going to teach you a couple of things. Uh, there's three sections to the Fret Zealot app. There is Play, which I'm not going to go too far into. I mean, I'll show you. Uh, you can do a search for a song, or you can add favorites. Uh, you know, smoke what, on the water, or House of the, the Rising um, Sun. What's the library like with the songs? Eh, you know, I did a search for Nirvana. Nothing. No, oh, well, they're not that Which, big. I feel like you got. I mean, if it's a guitar thing, you got to have some Nirvana in there. Sorry, <laughs> th th that may be a lot to ask. Um, I'm just but, kidding, by the way. About this. And so basically, Nirvana. let's see if this will even work here. If I hit play. You can see on my neck, I don't know if you can see this, but the light's flashing around. And if if I kind of coordinated with the app that's showing me, you know, the, kind of the playing piano role of the notes that I'm supposed to be playing in order to do House of the Rising Sun, I could over time follow these and work on it. And it would be, you know, that would, could be a way that I learn how to play House of the Rising Sun. Um, so that's great. I did have a little trouble with this, though, on, on Android. iOS, it was maybe a little bit more straightforward. Uh, there is a guitar tuner. That's nice to have always. Uh, there is Fun, which is what I showed you initially, which is you hit random and you get these little fun uh, effects on the, on the neck of the guitar. I can keep hitting it and go into different places. And that would be nice in a, in a live environment, let's say. But learn is, I feel like, the strength, the real kind of, the, the reason that you might want to do this. If you've never played guitar before, you can jump into learn. And even for me, as, as a, guitar, a guitarist, I could see pulling up like a scale or, or something along those lines in a song that I'm working on that I maybe don't have, let's say, a lead break figured out on or whatever. And it will light up all of the frets on all the strings that fit that, that key. Hmm. So okay. then I could really kind of fake my way through it and only hit the things, you know, that are in that key, right? You could fake you could fake your way through it and, and feel like you're coming up with something. So I'm going to show like that's you what I'm doing on this show today. Exactly. Fake it till you make it. Yeah. That's what they say. <laughs> so I'm going to show you how to create a scale here or how to how to play a scale. You've never played guitar never. at all no. whatsoever. We've got sound, right? Okay. Right now it's just kind of doing the little flashy thing. But if I was to Hit E on here. Let's let's go to uh, E and E major. Sure. So I'm in E major. I'm only lighting up the first string, right? And what you can see there is if I wanted to do the E major scale, it's open to that fret, to that fret, to that fret. It lights every fret that makes up that scale. Okay. And you were playing around. I'm going to hand this to I'm you. I'm getting nervous. Yeah. I knew, you, I knew this guitar was going to come this way. We already talked earlier about how demos on on okay. on TV never so go as planned. Put this on over here. Yep. Okay. Okay. Put this here. There. Okay. Here's a pick if that makes it okay. easier. This is or the maybe coolest it doesn't. Look, so I don't let's know. get a good shot right now. Okay. <laughs> this is the first time <laughs> that Rich has played that's, guitar. That's, okay. That's the best I'll look for the rest of this segment. So okay. Fine. All right. So if Fret Zellet was not on here, and I said, Hey, Rich. Why don't you play me an E major scale on oh, the first no string? Problem. You'd be like, I don't know. You'd be like so. big question mark over your forehead. But because you have Fret Zellet on here, 
you can play it, that this basically means uh, oh, finger off okay. because this is like open. So first Start of all, there. play the open string, the first string open, which means no okay. finger on it. Yep, and now follow the lights. Yeah, you skipped one, but that's okay. Oh, I skipped one? Yeah, that's all right. I thought it sounded a little tuny. Hey, you did it. You did it. You did the, you did the, uh, wow. the E major scale. I don't hear a lot of clapping scale. in this room, so clearly. I think, I mean, probably, honestly. Day one may not impress your friends with this uh, fret zealot, but maybe after a while. Here, here's the deal, though. With, when it comes to something like learning guitar, if you've never played guitar before, if I was to sit down with you as an instructor and you were the student, You'd be and, really I, and I'd be like, let's do, you know, the first thing that we're going to do is an E major scale uh, on the first string, there would still be a lot of confusion, right? Not having those lights there, it ends up looking like an infinite mass of lines on the on the the fretboard and you aren't going to know where to go. This at least gives you a direction. It gives you a guide to follow. All right, give me Stairway to Heaven. Let me try it. Okay, I'm sure it's in here, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm afraid to go into that section of the app. <laughs> I want the app to continue working. All right, so you now know how to do a scale and it's a pretty basic scale on the first string. Now we're going to do a chord. All oh, right. There's more. This is, this is where things get a little complicated because a chord... <laughs> Do we have our first I, crash? We have our first crash. Okay. Let's see if we can get resynced with Fred Zellett. It says crash detected. I'm not going to let them know. I, I always like to go to fun and put on random to see if it's resynced, which Just it's to not. Make sure. So I'm going to go into the Bluetooth settings. And I see the Bluetooth is not lit up. It now. was not lit up. There's my Fred Zellett. I'm going to activate that. It'll think. And then it'll most of the time tell me that we're connected. Do random and hey, we're getting little blinks on the on the on the guitar, so we're good. All right, so I'm gonna go into the chord section and hope that it doesn't crash a second time. Oh dear. Oh, it wasn't the doing this before. This Double is new. Double crash. Yeah. So. All right. I mean, well, I guess I'll just play freestyle then. <laughs> as as long as you stay. No, dang it! I'm not giving you the lights. Okay, now I'm able to go in. So let me try. I'm gonna connect. Please let this work. I think I sound better without the fret zealot. That's, I mean. Is that pretty good? I the, mean, do a lot, you, of people, good are a lot of people able to do that? You've got good strumming control, let's say. Uh, but I feel like we can make That's that it. chord even richer. Yay, we got in. There we okay, go. Okay, are you getting the feed? You are. So we're going to go to, we're going to do a very easy chord. It's E minor. So I'm going to dial up E minor. Now, as I do this, if you take a look, you'll see on the guitar that these strings are all open, and then these, lift your finger for a second, you're gonna, the blue is your pointer finger, the green is your middle finger. So put the blue on that string, nope, nope, nope. Uh, blue right there, and the green right there. Basically, this is the fret that you're trying to push okay. down on. Oh, so it's got two, I see. Yeah, so it's a little hard, because okay, they're close together. Okay, that's a little together. trickier, for sure. And now, yeah. I, now I strum those two? Strum them all. Oh. Hey. All right. That sounded really good. Didn't that, that sound amazing? You're, you're like almost Jimi Hendrix. If I switch this to major, see? That, I just added that. Major, that was not. I know. That, see, that was extra. You're feeling, you're feeling the rhythm, though. You're feeling the music. I'm thing. feeling it. All right, I'm, so I'm now you've got your pointer on the blue. OK. Your ring finger on the green. Uh, this is kind of. Oh, that doesn't go that way. Uh, OK, there we go. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I'm trying to think how I do this. Uh, I da, think da, 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 da. like that. Middle, middle ring pointer. Middle, okay. Middle ring pointer. Uh, 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 uh. Here, I'm gonna try and go like that. Okay. <laughs> it's not easy. And then strum maybe. All of it. Yeah. So that's uh, you almost. It's it's uh, kind of muting it a tiny bit, but I heard it in there. That's what makes it the major instead of the minor. It's a little so, trickier. It is because you got three fingers. Yeah. But that's kind of the point, right? Is that prior to this, you'd never held a guitar in your hands. No. And some of the first things that you've guitar ever hero. done with a guitar were actual chords and actual scales instead of yeah. fumbling. I mean, and I definitely see how if, if this was something you were doing on your own and you yeah. spent a lot of time, it is a great way to learn. And it, sure. I'm sure it's not the first time people have learned this way, but it's a very good use of technology, especially that you can put it on any guitar. Well, and that's kind of the beauty of it. There are guitars, there are learning guitars that have LEDs kind of in, installed into them. Uh, they're more expensive, although right. this is not inexpensive. It's $199.99, which... Let's be honest, if the app is going to be as kind of iffy as it is, is a lot to ask right now. I feel like it needs a lot of refinement on the app to really get the, the Bluetooth connection good, um, to get some of the, the aspects of the app, like 
it comes with a mount so that you can mount it in portrait, but then you go into certain sections of the app and suddenly it switches to, to landscape. And it's just weird, like when you're holding a guitar to have to do those kind of motions and it kind of gets a little inconvenient. But it is cool, it's nice. There's also a section called Lessons, which I won't go into entirely, but what this does, this brings in uh, some videos that are that download as you use them. Justin Guitar, is a uh, he's on YouTube and he does a lot of guitar instructions. But what they've done is they've taken all of his lessons and they've actually cued it in a way that as you're watching, the things that he's fingering and everything appear on the guitar. Oh, that's so smart. if you're listening and following his instruction, you know where he actually is. Hmm. So, so for, for a learning guitarist, I imagine the next time we have you on the new screensavers, you will be almost yeah. like Jimi Hendrix. Uh, I think so. Okay, that's or, not too much to ask, is it? No, <laughs> I, I will take this. I'll take this whole thing home. I just take this all. Yo, oh, yeah, totally. Okay. Yes, I'll it's take yours. This, and I will uh, definitely practice. Congratulations. And my iPad as well. <laughs> I don't know if you want this iPad. You probably have a better one. Uh, this is a little old. But uh, yeah, so that's that's Fred Zellin. What do you think? I, I really think it's cool. I think um, here's the thing I'm trying to figure out. As a as a novice, mm -hmm. would I think this is better, or you know what I mean? Would I be frustrated by this thing? Yeah, I mean, and that's a, that's a really good question. I think it depends on what you're using it for. I, as you know, someone who's played a guitar for a very long time, trying to like learn the songs aspect, the 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 play section of the app where it has the songs that you recognize and going in there. Right. There's something weird about the interface and how, how it connects with your brain that it's really hard to follow along, even though technically it should be a really useful tool to see all the places on the, on the, on the neck that you put your fingers. But I feel like it almost, it, it just, there's something missing there and it's really hard to connect in the same way that it is when you sit down with like a book of tablature and, and you follow along that way. Um, in some ways though, I think it could really help. Like it's really nice to be able to pull up a scale on all six strings and know these are the notes I can play and these are the notes I should stay away from. Cool. Kind of takes some of the thought out yeah, of it. Yeah, so. I, I, I think it, de it definitely has a place in the future of learning guitar, sure. I think. Um, now, this is not like a live concert where at the end we destroy the guitar. Oh, man. So I I'm going to take that, that from was, you and, okay, put it and mount it uh, over in my guitar stand. As okay. fun as it would be to smash this over the set, I don't want to do that. Not this time, anyways. All right, Fret Zealot. Fret Zealot. I think you go to fretzealot.com and uh, you can order one for yourself. All right, where are we? Oh, I know where we are. You ready to take a call? Oh, let's do it. Call for help time. All right, we have on the line George from Youngstown, Ohio. How you doing, George? What's up? Good. How are you guys? <laughs> We're doing all right. I think uh, Rich is all warmed up now. I think he wanted to play lead breaks, but that's okay. We're going to answer your question and then maybe play a lead Okay, break. great. Do you play the guitar? That's the first question here. <laughs> no, not at all. Okay. Are you ready to? We're going to ship that guitar to you. <laughs> Don't oh, say that. Not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. Uh, so, George, tell us a, a little bit about your question. You, you sent in a question, and it has to do with kind of phone, phone recommendation advice. We'll see if we can help you out. Sure. A um, little history on my phones. I started with a Nexus One back in the day and moved on to an S3, which I rooted around custom ROM on it, Cyan Engine Mod, yep. since I owned it, and had a Nexus 6P for a long time, which I've loved. But I ran into some battery problems. Now, Huawei replaced the battery once, and I came back again where it was dying about a percent a minute. So I thought, I'll give it my own try and try to change the battery myself. Uh, it all went great, and as mm -hmm. I was closing it, I severed the wire in the back, so now the Nexus 6P is no more. Tell me I'm how you felt at that exact moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was terrible. The, the screen lit up, and I was so excited. I'm like, I did this, and then yeah. when I pushed it shut, oh. it went away, and I could still feel the vibrations and hear it, uh, but the screen was dead. Oh, um, that's got to be bad. So, so now I'm using an S5 with a bad USB port on the bottom, so I added wireless charging to it just to get by until I pick something up. Um, I really liked that normal Android experience where you had no ads onto it, very bare minimum, just yep. you could add what you wanted and tweak it how you wanted. And Android One almost feels like it's doing what the Nexus line used to do, mm -hmm. and the Pixel is doing pure Android with Google on top of it. My wife has a Pixel One, loves it. Um, of course, it was very expensive when we bought it, and I'm wagering on going between the Nokia 6 and the next iteration of the Pixel. And there's probably a big price difference there. I'm on T-Mobile, so I'm looking for some advice on which direction I should go. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there are definitely two very different avenues, right? Like the Pixel 3, we don't really know much of anything about the Pixel 3. We know that Google is, you know, putting components into the next version of Android that will facilitate that wonderful word we keep hearing, a notch in the display. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very possible. More signs seem to be pointing to the possibility that the Pixel 3 is going to have a notch. Not that that sells phones, but maybe for some people it does. Uh, but no doubt about it, the Pixel 3, you're talking a premium smartphone, right? Like you're not, yeah. They're not going to come out with the next generation of Pixel and be like, no. yeah, now they're only $599. Like, they're just not <laughs> going to do that. No. Um, but with the Pixel, you are getting you know, everything that Google has to offer. You're right. getting the best that Google has to offer. You're comparing against the um, Nokia 6, is that what you mentioned? Uh, yeah. Which is kind of one of those Android One devices, which I don't really think this was meant for the States, right? Wasn't this kind of an international device? That, that was initially. Initially, you when Google, it, it was. It's only very recently that that Google's kind of opened up Android One, and that, as you as you say, George, it really does mm -hmm. seem like their new approach with Android One is that it's like the mid-range, uh, you know, phone with minimal, you know, cruft, minim minimal extra, you know, stuff that you don't want on there. You can get it at Best Buy, two twenty nine. So, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. It really comes down to. What do you want out of your device? Do you want, uh, is the camera the most important? Is the performance the most important? What's the biggest thing to you? Yeah. Uh, probably performance, I guess. I'm a technology teacher, so I use it a lot in my classroom. Uh, very often I'll cast from my phone to the screen, mm. and that may be an issue on a mid range device. Yeah, I, I think that's where you're going to be. That's going to be tough on the, it's going to work, I think, on the Nokia, but this is not a spec'd out device. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Pixel mm -hmm. is pretty much a spec'd out device. It has the highest specs you can get for right. pretty much, an, I mean, besides like a, um, a Samsung device, but clearly you don't want that because it has a lot of. Stuff Other stuff, it. yeah. It's not yeah, the yeah, right. pure experience. Um, how about this idea? What about uh, getting your wife the new phone and you taking her phone? I don't think she'll let it go. <laughs> 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 she got the nice one, 128 gigs yeah. on it, and yeah. it's never slowed down for her, and that was her problems in the past with the phones. She had a Note 2 before this, and that was kind of a nightmare for her. That would like grind to a halt on random, occur random times, right? Oh, yeah. And, the, and there's something to be said for you both kind of being in the same, you know, on the on the same phone uh, tangent. Yeah. Or, or uh, how would you, you wouldn't it. be able to tweet Team Pixel if you weren't on the same team. You know what I mean? That's right, of course. I mean, they say <laughs> families that tweet together, you know. Um, <laughs> tweet I, together. Personally, I'm a Pixel guy. I, you know, yeah. I, as I have my iPhone here, but I love the Pixel. <laughs> Um, I think they, they are some of my favorite phones out there. Probably, I think it's the best Android phone available, even including the S9. Um, and so personally, I'm going to steer towards that at all costs. So, I mean, if you, if you want the best that's out there, Pixel 3 is going to be, I don't, I'm not really sure what they're going to add. You know, mm -hmm. the gesture support, clearly we're going to probably get something like that in the mm -hmm. notch, mm -hmm. which I'm not really excited about. But at the same time, maybe you wait for the Pixel 3 to drop and then you go with the Pixel 2. And then you save some oh, money. Oh, yeah, you'd save some money. Because the price that. usually comes down. Yeah, and you still get okay. some of the benefits, you know, with, with like the unlimited photo uploads and, you know, all of the updates and everything. Because I, I think what I keep going back to as we're talking is if your priority is performance, like if that's like your number one stated priority, then I think you have to go with the Pixel over the Nokia 6. There might be other phones out there that maybe are also included on that list, but between these two that you have mentioned, the Pixel wins hands down. The Nokia 6 uh, you know, is running a Snapdragon 630 processor, three or four gigs of RAM, and you mentioned that you know there was a possibility that you get the four gig of RAM version uh, in the US. I saw it on Amazon, it's the international version, but that means that it's unlocked mm -hmm. and it would work with your carrier uh, for $309. You could totally do that. It would probably be good in a lot of different ways. But if you, what you're talking about is I need, absolutely mm -hmm. have to have top, you know, top level performance, then, I mean, between those two, you have to go Pixel as far as I'm concerned. And does the Android One get the updates at the same rate? Is uh, it, you know, I mean, plus, does it have all the features that the Pixel would have? So it doesn't have a lot of the software features because the Pixel, you know, like, like you said, it, the Android One stuff is almost like vanilla Android, right? Pixel is Google's Android, which is actually different. Pixel is like Google's Samsung device, if that makes sense. Uh, they've, they've added extra stuff into the launcher that's different from the standard stock Android launcher. And they're extra features, and they're really cool, but it's an extension of 
the stand you know the standard version of Android. So if that's a priority, then maybe the, the Nokia is the right way to go because Android One really is closer to stock and doesn't have some of those bells and whistles. I haven't personally used the the Android One device, so I just don't know about the quality and the speed of yeah. that device. Like I just I would hate for you to get that phone and then you get it home and like literally as you're installing your apps you're noticing little hiccups here, little yeah. kind of frame drops, that kind of stuff and you're just like getting frustrated from day one knowing that this is sort of an underpowered device. Don't forget you're going to be running modern apps on a device that might not be equipped to handle those apps. When you're in these um, emerging countries with these emerging markets that this is meant for, they're using things like a light version of Facebook or uh, a light version of Facebook Messenger. You're going to be installing probably the, the real versions of these apps. So mm -hmm. that could also take a toll on the performance. And you mentioned that's the, the number one feature that you mm -hmm. like. Sure. Okay. Well, I appreciate your help. So where, where, where's your head at? What are you thinking? Are you leaning for the Pixel at this point? See what the Pixel 3 is, and then if it's not what I need, maybe go for the Pixel 2 instead. Are you are you cool waiting until that, that day? Because, I mean, you're probably going to be waiting four or five months at least until you know. The Nexus 1 still fires up, so I might always use that again. <laughs> no, yeah. Think, think of this as like an exercise of, of reliving <laughs> your phones of, of Christmas past. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope that's helpful, and uh, we really appreciate you calling in and uh, being Thanks. part of today's show. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, George. <laughs> All right, take care. Best of luck. Uh, we have a whole lot coming up, but uh, I should tell you a little bit about next week's show. Patrick Norton and Father Robert Balasser are going to be standing in these spots. Neither of them are going to be playing guitar, unfortunately, um, as far as I know anyways. If you want them to answer your tech questions, here's how you do it. Need tech help? The new screensavers are here with answers. Email your tech questions to newscreensavers at twit.tv. All right, we're taking the, the light, the light theme that we have going today, okay. and we're cranking it up to 11. Megan Maroney uh, has some fancy modular lights, smart lights, to show us called the Nano Leaf. Let's check it out. In an effort to find everything under the sun that could make my home smarter, I recently stumbled upon Nanoleaf. It's a company that makes smart lights. If by smart, you mean cool. And I do, because we all know that smart is cool. Nanoleaf sent us this light panel starter kit, and it was incredibly easy to set up, which is not often the case with many smart lights or other IoT devices that I've tried. You simply download the app, Unbox the triangular panels and snap them together in the shape you want. Pair the panels to your phone and then turn them off or on. Then choose colors and designs all with an app. You can select designs from Nanoleaf or download color combinations designed by the Nanoleaf community. Nanoleaf also sent us the rhythm module, which will let you sync your lights to the music. This was also super easy to set up. Just plug the Nanoleaf rhythm into any free panel port Wait for the indicator light to stop blinking. Press the center triangle to turn the rhythm on. Press it again to change the music scene. You can also talk to the panels or play music to them. You can customize and create your own music scenes in the app. And let's be honest, part of the fun of a smart home is wowing all your friends and family when they come over. You can not only control the light panels with your app, Nanoleaf also supports HomeKit, Amazon Echo, and Google Assistant, so you can use your voice to start your dance party. Siri, turn on my romantic scene. Okay, your scene is set. Siri, turn on my forest theme. Forest, sure. Siri, turn on my Vader theme. Vader, you got it. Siri, turn on my Stranger Things theme. Stranger Things, coming up. The only real downside to the Nano Leaf is the price. The starter kit with the Rhythm Edition costs $229.99. Now, if you think of this as a piece of art for your wall, then $229 is not that much. But if you think of it as a cool toy you'll occasionally bring out for parties when you remember, then $299 is a lot. I'm also not a huge fan of the shape of the panels. I guess you could say they're not exactly my design aesthetic. I'm looking forward to the square panels that are coming soon. 
$399? That's a lot, but those any sort of smart light is yeah. expensive, even the light bulbs. So, I mean, I suppose so. I mean, those panels are really cool. Never in a million years did I think that uh, that whole kit would be $299. I guess, you know, LEDs, like, I just think LEDs are inexpensive, but I mean, Fred Zellett, same deal, right? Yeah, like, and the majority of it is a strip of, of LED lights, smart. Don't get me wrong, but um, still pretty expensive for what you get. Yeah, I think the price will come down on something like that in the future. Yeah, yeah I guess we'll find out. Uh, I think it's time to read some mail. And apparently we have a mailbox to do that from. Thank you, Mr. Mailbox Man. Uh, last week there was nothing special in here. Just thought I'd point that out. Ah, oh, you shouldn't have. Who is this? I, on, I'll be completely honest, I had no idea this was in there. Oh, it's an album. Is wow. this yours, Alex? Oh, it's John's. John Slanina, you're the best. Thank you. There we go. There's my Is, is album. he returning that to sender? I don't <laughs> <Yeah>. know. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, you know what? I don't want this. That's the you first return from your Kickstarter. Uh, John, your CD's in the mail. Here we go. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, I was not expecting that. Next message is in the mailbag, too. Actually, actually, here. Go ahead and pick. All right, uh, let's see. It's like a magic trick. I think you made me pick this one. <laughs> yes. It's the king of spades. No. Uh, okay, I have email one. I'll go ahead and read it first. This is from Debbie, and she says, I work at a community college where many students have limited incomes and have bought cheaper iPhone and Android phones and are running out of memory. Uh, I think memory storage, I think, is the, the, the way this is here. Many thought they could simply stash all their data in the cloud, but apps want to download the data to local storage, making cloud storage less useful than one would think. What are your top tips for someone who needs to get work done on the phone that they have? What are the top apps for thrifty memory usage? And so this one, I, th I feel like, is, is a little bit of a challenge because I, I understand that, like there are Android devices out there Android is as one example uh, that have like eight gigs of internal storage, which is insanely low. Yeah, that's really. I mean, you're you're basically filling that with the operating system. Yeah. As soon as you install three apps, it's it's right. taken up. Yeah. So you know, those are apps that like, at most, you're you're getting this phone to do the the core things that you need to do: browse the internet, you know, browse websites, phones, text, that sort of stuff. Upload to Instagram. Emails. <laughs> Maybe. Just the basics. With, yes. <laughs> Some people would consider that part of the basics. Um, but so from my perspective, what you probably need if you're dealing with limited storage on a device is you need some way to manage the storage because there's, there's little way to change the behavior. If you're storing all of your documents in the cloud and you need to use those on your device, the way, you know, often the way they do that is they download it to your device and that occupies storage space in your device. So how do you go about that? Uh, there are apps on Android, I'll start with Android first, that allow you to jump into your storage and smartly, intelligently, uh, pick out and remove things from your device that you really don't need. The app that I'm thinking of is actually a Google app, it's called Files Go. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to do this. You, you're able to analyze uh, your device and remove duplicate files. It, it takes a look at apps that you may have installed but haven't used in a really long time. It says, why is this taking up space? It removes the app, leaves the data there so you don't lose that, but it removes the app. Just a lot of smart ways to clean up your storage. Do you have this on your phone? Do you have this installed? I do. Yeah. I mean, it'll notify you, too. It'll be like, hey, yep. this stuff is taking up a bunch of storage. A couple things I'd throw in is... Um, the photo, Google Photos is kind of a necessity yeah. if you're if you have no storage on your device, and there's also if you kind of hard press it, you know, you get the little options. Mm -hmm. You can just do free up space, you know. Mm -hmm. So every, I mean, if you have a phone with a little bit of storage, you're gonna have to do that all the time because as soon as you right. take a couple pictures, you want to do that. I actually like an app called HTC Boost Plus. Now I know I'm not gonna recommend like the clean masters of the world, <laughs> or whatever, you know what I mean? Well, yeah, so I like, know exactly you install what you mean. them, it's just like your yeah. phone is like it's downhill uh, spiral. But I find that the HTC Boost Plus actually works. Oh, okay. And it's kind of like the files go, and it, it does scan all your stuff for the memory and stuff, but it does a good job of like clearing out some of the memory oh, okay. in a non-evasive way, where it's not just like going crazy and sending you um, malware and spam ads all the time. That's I find good. that it's pretty much legit. 
And it's an HTC app? Yeah, and I don't know, I'm trying to figure out when the last time it was updated, but I, you know, I usually use this on my Android devices. Look, it gets good ratings. Yeah. Um, and it's from HTC. Let's see, when was the last uh, update? April 25th, 2018. So they're still, so. you know, still updating yep. it, which is nice. And I just find that all those other ones, like the, like I said, look at the one on the side, the Clean Master and all that stuff. Yeah. They're just, sure. don't stay away from those. Anything yeah. with a brush, a little sweepy brush, <laughs> <laughs> don't <laughs> download to your phone, please. <laughs> Very good. And Waikiki Guru in chat says Boost Plus does a great job on HTC phones as well. So backing that up. As far as iOS is concerned, um, I, I think what I found here, now I'm not a, a regular iOS user, but I didn't know this about iOS. If you go into settings and general and storage, you're able to manage your storage space as you would imagine. But there's something in there called offload unused apps fun uh, function, and it automatically does this when your storage is low. So kind of what I was trying to find on iOS is some sort of automatic way to help you, guide you in that direction. And it seems like this is what it does. It deletes the app itself, but not the app data to make room. And when that happens automatically, the icon is still left on your screen, but it's faded out. So you know that it's not mm -hmm. existing on your device at that, at that moment in time, but that you can get it back if you need to. So there's going to be, if you need mm -hmm. that, app in the future, there's going to be a little time where you have to tap it and download it. And re-download you know, it. Kind of yeah. like get it to reinstall, but the data's all there. Right. Um, and that's a newer feature. I believe that's kind of when they revamped uh, iOS. Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, one thing I would add to this is in your photos. This, a lot of times, people don't have the optimized photos um, enabled under your settings in your Photos app. Okay. So what and happens is... what does is, that do? Well, if you have iCloud enabled, you're kind of... It's like, you know, all your photos are residing on your phone. But if you don't have optimized iPhone storage turned on, it's keeping all the full res on your phone. Uh, if you have that turned on, it'll upload them to the cloud, and then it'll manage if it's saying like, "Oh, why are her photo? Why are these photos taking up half the space?" Let's offload, you know, some of the. Oh, man. And you'll have basically thumbnails on your phone when you clip uh, tap one, then it downloads it for the full That's res. That's really nice. Yeah, but you have to have that turned on. So, yeah. and I'm not sure if Apple turns it on by default, or you have to. But I'll usually show people that if they're like, why is my phone out of storage, you know? That sounds like Make a sure really good on. tip there. Yeah, I, did, I didn't even know about that. Awesome. Hopefully that, yeah. that helps. All right, what's the next one? Oh, that's my You got it. <laughs> question. Here we go. Uh, I am looking forward to buying the new Moto G6 in the near future. But I wonder if there's an easy way to move Google Authenticator to it. I have four Oof. accounts which use two-factor authentication. Thanks. Do you use... Uh, Two-factor apps? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you have to. I mean, yeah. I always recommend that you do. I personally use Authy. I do too. Which I think is really, it's way easier to move between phones because uh, yeah. it's its set up for that. I don't even know if you can do that with Google Authenticator. So you can. And uh, I was under the impression in my mind that uh, when I first read this email that you couldn't, or uh, I just hadn't heard how. And it, back when I started my whole two-factor uh, switch a, a while back, a couple of years ago at this point, um, I had started with Authenticator, and then I saw the light with Authy, yeah. and you know I haven't turned back. Authy makes it really easy to switch from device to device. You just kind of install it on the new <clears throat> device, you know, uh, log in with your with your standard authentication with the passwords given. You can remember the password. That's the challenge because that you don't is, enter it very much. Yes, definitely. Uh, that is the big thing about Authy is you have a backup password that you need to remember. Yeah, you really you, need to remember. And, and just it, make it something easy. Yeah, it it will no, give. You little, yeah, no, 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 sorry. That flew right over my head. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, make it, though, make it recallable enough yes. because you don't enter it in all the time, but it's your, it's your, oh, no, what have I done password to, yeah. to get it all back when you've really messed things up. Thankfully, you don't mess things up if you do, if you plan right accordingly. But you're not on Authy. So, so that's like our plug for Authy, I suppose. <laughs> uh, however, with Authenticator, it is possible to do this. You just, you have to jump through a little bit more hoops. It's not set up for this inside the app. You uh, install Authenticator on your new device. Uh, then you go into a browser in, on a desktop, let's say, log into your Google account and go to the uh, two-step two verification page within your Google account. Um, it, within there, you're going to find an Authenticator section with a little pencil next to it. You tap that pencil to edit and you want to select change phones. So you're Ooh, basically telling your okay. Google account I'm going to a new phone mm -hmm. uh, with, with my Authenticator app. You should be presented with a QR code on the screen because that's how Auth uh, Authenticator does things is with a QR code that you then on the new device in the Authenticator app, scan that QR code mm. and then you're going to have to authenticate with the two-factor code that's given. But once you do that, you're in. Your Google account is then tied to this new phone with Authenticator, but you're not done. Okay. 
you still had to go into the apps that were associated with the old Authenticator app okay. and uh, do the QR code process there as well. So you're basically okay. bringing them over manually. So I, I guess that's how you switch devices. There is no automatic way to say, I've switched devices and they all come with me. You're still kind of doing some of the heavy lifting. And that ends up being why I use Authy. Because so, I use so many different devices, that would be a real big pain if I had to do that every time. I don't really understand what the benefit of that is, though, because if yeah. you're moving everything over and you're scanning the QR codes again, then you're not, it's, nothing is really kind of coming over. No, but it, but it is telling your Google account, and you may not realize that, that Google does it this way, it is telling your Google account that your Authenticator app exists on this device and not that mm, device now, okay. and to look over here instead of there. So there is a little bit of a process switching from device, but you're right, it's not nearly as automatic. Once once yeah. you do that, you still kind of have to do some work uh, with the individual sites that you're using. But to the defense of the work, I will say it feels like you're being really secure because yes. you're putting so much effort in Absolutely. that you're just like, all right, this is better be the most secure thing because you do have to go through a lot of hoops. It's right. not just like, you know, Authy almost makes me feel sometimes that it's too simple. And I'm just like, wait, why is this so easy? You know, that's that's kind of um, the, the common the, the common thought around security is that, you know, if it's easy, then it's inherently less secure. Right. right. Um, so Authy does make that a little bit easier. But, you know, what are you giving up in that process? Maybe maybe you're okay with that. Maybe you're not, and that's what you kind of have to have to come up with on your own. So, but two factor, good to have on. So that absolutely, that was a great question, by the way. That's mm -hmm. a very meaty question. Absolutely, two factor is a really good idea. If you're not set up on it, definitely look it up and go into it. Um, just don't mess it up quite like I did on uh, this week in Google uh, a couple of years ago. I locked myself out of my Google account. Oh, that would not and be good. Thankfully, somebody watching the show that works at Google was able to get me back in. But there were a couple of days where I was pretty certain I had like lost my account forever. And oh, when wow. that happens, you look inward and you realize just how much you depend on these services to work and you yeah. realize what you lose if they don't. So, some lessons to be learned. Wow. Rich DeMiro, this was a lot of fun. This was uh, fun. As it was last time, it was even more fun this time, and hopefully next time I don't know if uh, you, need that. you can teach me how to play guitar. Uh, I think I will. By the time <laughs> I, I practice, I'm usually here like every six months or so, or yeah. like once a year. So, so you've I think got a lot of time to I've practice. I've got some time to practice. So. <laughs> right on. Uh, Rich, what do, what do you want to leave people with? What do you want people to know about uh, all the cool stuff you're doing when you're uh, here? My website, richontech.tv. Uh, you know, if you're in LA, you can watch me on KTLA. If you're on a bunch of, you know, different cities, I'm on. I do like a tech segment for a bunch of different cities across America. So you can watch in like Cleveland, Chicago, um, all over the place. But there's my website, so um, you can go there. I've got a podcast, Rich on Tech. Nice. So um, you can listen to that every day. You can see links to what I talk about. And um, I just, you know, my thing is I just like to make tech fun. And if something's happening in the world, you know, help you solve your problems when it comes to tech, like, you know, the Gmail revamp that just happened, you yeah. know, kind of explaining. Are you loving that, by the way? Uh, you know, I'm an inbox user. Oh, so, so you already But, had but I have switched one of my computers to Gmail so, so that I'm living in it and everything. Yeah. And yeah, it's, I mean, I, I like the changes, but I just, I, I work better in inbox than I do. Interesting. Email. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm a new Gmail guy. What do you mean? That's the new Gmail. Oh, I thought you just switched over to Gmail. I was like, how, how no, no, did no, that the even new happen? Gmail. No, it's oh, only okay. been a week, right. but I'm like, I'm fully in. Um, I was like, that's what it. were you on, Yahoo? <laughs> no. Okay, now I understand. No judgment, though. If you are, look, if <laughs> you're in great. AOL, you, it's fine. It's great. You know? it's great I've been trying to get my mom off of AOL now for like 16 years. You know? <laughs> it works for At her. At least she's not her. paying for the service anymore like she was like six months ago. <laughs> right. Wow. Okay. You know you don't have to pay that anymore. <laughs> Rich, this was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Yep. Really appreciate it. Uh, and you can find me, well, I'm, I'm all over the Twit network these days, twit.tv, uh, you know, Tech News Weekly, all about Android, do triangular from time to time and I get to hop in here oh no how and I get to hop in here and do new screensavers every once in a while having a lot of fun so thank you uh, you know yellowgomusic.com if you want to find that album uh, but twit.tv for everything else that I do in my life uh, twit has a newsletter by the way if you want to subscribe to the newsletter you can go to twit.tv slash newsletter you're gonna get news information about our shows that are publishing we do a kind of a weekly promo with some clips of some of the best moments th from throughout the week go to twit.tv slash newsletter and you will not miss 
an announcement on future shows, things that we have coming up. And we're about to enter a very busy time with some live events like Google I.O. and a bunch of other stuff. So uh, subscribe and you won't miss it. Also, you can subscribe to this show, twit.tv slash NSS for new screensavers. Find us on YouTube. We're at youtube.com slash the new screensavers. And you can send us an email if you want to be a part of the show. That's new screensavers at twit.tv. TV. I think I've covered all the bases now, and uh, we really appreciate you guys joining us each and every week. And thanks to everyone who came uh, and, and watched in the, in, in the audience, and uh, really appreciate it. We'll uh, talk to you all very soon on the new screensavers. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>